What's up everybody, Gen X Dividend Investor here. In this video I'm going to tell you why 2022 might be a good year in the stock market, even though some experts are predicting epic crashes. So if you appreciate videos like this then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. I open this video with a quote from a Roman Stoic philosopher because I feel like it's something that most of us do, which is that we suffer in the present moment because we worry about what might happen rather than actually needing to suffer at all because our present is fine. What I mean is that many people are worried that the markets might crash, which I get, but the reality is if you own quality dividend stocks then you don't need to worry about it, even if it happens. No one knows what today or tomorrow will bring in the stock market, so whenever you hear a prediction of a crash then please realize that they're just guessing. Which is actually the first reason why 2022 could be a bull market which is because no one knows where we'll end up as we transition into 2023, it could be years before a mega crash happens, or it could be happening as I'm filming this video. One good data point to be aware of is that there tend to be more periods of time when we're in bull markets than in bear markets, which itself is another reason why this could end up being a bull year. Here's a diagram from Schwab which shows the last 60-ish years in the stock markets. It says that bull markets tend to last for around five and a half years, whereas bear markets only last for about one and a quarter years on average. So as long as you have more bull than bear, then you'll keep trending up, though obviously that also means that you'll have some periods of down or sideways to deal with. A reality is that bear markets can abruptly change to bull markets, and bull markets can abruptly change to bear markets. Thus long-term investors usually do better if they just keep holding and buying rather than trying to time the market and completely sell out or whatever. In my experience, it seems that when tons of people are thinking things are going to crash, this is actually a good reason for why it won't crash. Thus, that's another reason why 2022 could be a bull market, i.e. I get more worried when average traders are in the mindset that stonks only go up. What I mean is that big crashes seem to happen when people are irrationally happy about the market, like in 2000, or when something hits you out of the blue like the pandemic. Pandemic aside, I'm not seeing that right now. I'm seeing lots of chatter, tweets, video titles, blogs, etc. about crashes, though sure, it's possible that too much negative sentiment could lead to overselling, which then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy which often causes a crash. Anyways, let's look at some indicators which have historically helped paint the picture of what the market is probably going to do. But before I do that, what I want you to understand is that one of the best ways to achieve long-term success in the stock market is simply to invest in quality companies, ideally when they're cheap. That's it. By quality I mean companies that have good growth paths, decent moats, positive financial trends, etc. By cheap I mean when a stock's price is lower than its intrinsic value. Now you can probably still do okay even if you buy good companies when they aren't cheap, but your overall returns will obviously be less. Like you could have bought Microsoft whenever in the last 30 years and if you'd still held it today you'd probably be happy, even though there was a period of around 15 years where it went sideways. Thus, quality is most important and buying quality when it's cheap is ideal. Here's a helpful diagram I made to show my perspective on how an example stock and its intrinsic value often play out over time. I've shown this picture before, but since I've got a bunch of new subscribers and because it's so important to understand, I'll briefly go over it again. So to overly simplify things, what usually happens in the stock market is that as a company's earnings go up, then its stock price goes up. Time is on the x-axis in this picture and how much a stock costs is on the y-axis. The black line is an example stock's price over time, which goes up and down, though slowly trends up, which is what most quality companies do over long periods of time. The blue line represents the intrinsic value of that company, which is the price that you want to be under when you buy or over when you sell, and the more under it you are, the bigger your margin of safety is. Calculating intrinsic value is important because it can help investors understand whether the cost of the stock is undervalued or overvalued compared to the market price of the stock. According to Warren Buffett, intrinsic value can be defined simply as the discounted value of cash that can be taken out of a business during its remaining life. Many folks use a discounted cash flow aka DCF to calculate the intrinsic value of a stock. There are several methods of evaluating a stock's intrinsic value, and two investors can form two completely different and probably valid opinions on the intrinsic value of the same stock. However, the general idea is to buy a stock for less than it's worth, and evaluating intrinsic value can help you do that. To calculate a DCF, you number one, estimate all the company's future cash flows, number two, calculate the present value of each of those future cash flows, and number three, sum up the present values to obtain the intrinsic value of the stock. 
Number one is the hardest part of doing a DCF, as it's part science and part educated guesstimating. The science parts are the historical cash flow statements you use combined with DCF formulas, along with the research you do into the company, to gain a good understanding of what you believe the company's growth prospects are, so you can make educated guesses about how cash flows might change in the future, which is the educated guesstimating part. There are limitations to DCFs where they aren't ideal for all stocks in all situations. Anyways, a goal of value investing is to buy stocks that are trading for less than their intrinsic value. No need to obsess over it, as nothing in finance is worth obsessing over, just keep learning. In the diagram you can see that intrinsic value changes over time as new information comes out, and I've found that a stock's intrinsic value tends to act like gravity or a magnet trying to pull the black line, which is the stock price at a point in time, back towards it which is why you want companies that keep growing. A stock's P.E. trend is kind of similar in the sense that each stock tends to have its own trend of P.E. that it oscillates around over time. Stock prices in the short term are overly influenced by news headlines and market events and ultimately people's emotions, thus they can easily break the pull of the blue intrinsic value line and go wherever for a while. So the ideal time to buy a stock is when it's underpriced, which is represented as areas of red where the stock price fluctuates under its intrinsic value price. Similarly, the time to contemplate selling a stock is when it's overpriced, aka higher than its intrinsic value, which is generally any period on this graph along the areas of green. I personally prefer to hold, but if you need to sell, then try to do it when you've made a nice profit and it's overpriced. And regardless of when you buy, remember that it's always possible that you can lose money in the markets. Now, this example picture could represent 20 years or more, so you need to understand that something could be underpriced for years or overpriced for years, but in my experience, stocks eventually tend to drive towards their real intrinsic values. Thus, the key takeaway is that if you buy quality stuff when it's on sale, and you don't panic sell, then I'd be willing to bet that you'll do great over the long run. Panic selling out of all your positions because you think a crash is imminent is timing the market, which is different from buying when things are cheap. It's also different from selling a position if you calculate it's extremely overvalued. Regardless of what you invest in, you got to learn how to control your fears and not hit the sell button just because some smart folks are saying we're going to crash. Peter Lynch has the best quote about market timers you should use to steady your nerves. He said, far more money has been lost by investors trying to time corrections than in all corrections combined. The point is that most people will simply do better by buying good stuff cheap and then keep holding through market crashes and volatility until you have a good reason to sell, like your core thesis for investing in the first place has changed. And even if the market timer gets it right this time, you've got to remember that there hasn't been anyone in history who has consistently been able to do it, which is why Lynch's quote is so telling. But you'll hear investors brag about the prolific market timing, and I recommend you ignore them. Instead, listen to Christopher Davis, another famous investor, who said, Though tempting, trying to time the market is a loser's game. $10,000 continuously invested in the market over the past 20 years grew to more than 48000 if you miss just the best 30 days, your investment was reduced to $9,900. Besides, if you're watching my channel, you're probably a dividend investor. Unfortunately, if you're investing strategy, your dividends should keep flowing in even if we crash. So why sweat the stock price or a market crash? Anyway, in my last video, I mentioned that multiple financial gurus like Michael Burry and Robert Kiyosaki are predicting epic stock market crashes. And you can even find that one of the largest finance channels on YouTube recently sold completely out of the stock market which is unfortunate as he'll influence a lot of people to do the same. While they could get lucky, most people don't. And again, even if someone gets the market top once, odds are they won't guess correctly other times, though the more you try it, the more you tend to do it, and it becomes a bad habit to pick up. Like Lynch said, if you're in the market, you have to know there's going to be declines. They're gonna happen. When they're gonna start, no one knows. If you're not ready for that, you shouldn't be in the stock market. I mean, the stomach is the key organ here, it's not the brain. Do you have the stomach for these kinds of declines? But timing the market is statistically unlikely. Listen to Larry Fink, the CEO of the world's largest asset management firm, BlackRock. He said, we spend too much time talking about market timing. Our big thrust is focusing on being in the market all the time, because most of us are not good enough at market timing. For those who have been in the market and stayed in the market after the 2008 crash into 2009, well, they really benefited, and those who ran away really were quite harmed by that action. Okay, back to why 2022 could be a bull market. Well, if the pandemic keeps trending in a better direction like it has, then I'd imagine that will continue to bring more bulls into the market. The more the pandemic goes away, the more people will go out and spend their money. They'll hit restaurants, they'll drive more, they'll celebrate life as they treat themselves. 
the whole economic engine can go into another gear, which in turn should mean more revenues and profits for businesses, which can then help make 2022 a good year. Why else could 2022 be a bull year? Well, supply chains have been slowly unclogging, which again allows the economic machine to get going faster. The faster supply chains get unplugged, the better most businesses do that have been constrained due to lack of computer chips or parts or whatever. All of that should help accelerate business results, which could be why 2022 ends up being a bull year. Okay, moving on, let's look at some indicators that people use to predict what will happen in the markets. But keep in mind the famous quote that says, markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. To me, that means the stock's price isn't always logical in the short term. Like a company has great earnings and it beats Wall Street estimates, yet it still plummets. My point is that indicators aren't guarantees of what will happen. So a common indicator people use are federal interest rates. Here's a chart of Fed interest rates over the last 60 years represented as the blue line. The gray areas represent times when the economy was in recession. The current federal funds rate as of February 7th, 2022 is at a very low 0.08%. Now the Fed's mission is to keep the US economy going along nicely, i.e. not too hot and not too cold. They raise rates when the economy is overly strong and lower rates when the economy is sluggish. When the economy booms and runs hot, things like inflation and stocks can get out of hand, so the Fed often steps in and raises interest rates, which helps cool down the economy and keeps growth on track. When we have recessions or fear of recessions, the Fed drops interest rates to help stimulate the economy, which is why in this picture you can see how during recessions rates are often dropping. Lowering rates makes borrowing money cheaper. Cheaper borrowing encourages consumer and business spending and investment and can boost asset prices like stocks. The U.S. economy has been running hot for quite some time and inflation is high, so now the Fed plans to raise rates, which leads to a bear view which is that if they raise too fast, the market could crash. Another bear view is that if we do crash, the Fed can't really lower rates anymore, so a lever they normally use to help things is already all the way down. But a bull case is that even when they raise rates will still be near all-time lows in terms of the overall rate, which means borrowing and spending should still probably be high and thus for 2022 the exact tailwind that people are saying could crash the markets could instead be the factor that helps keep the market propped up, enabling 2022 to end green overall for the year. Now let's look at the S&P 500 versus 10-year Treasury yields. Why? Well, lower bond yields mean higher stock prices because interest rates are the most significant factor in determining bond yields, and thus they play an influential role in the stock market. Here we see the 10-year Treasury yield in blue going from a bit over 3% in 1960 up to over 15% in 1981, and then down to a low in 2020 of about 0.7% and up to its current 1.94%. We can see that as Treasury yields come down, the SP 500 goes up. So even though we've started inching up, it's still near all-time lows and should remain there for all of 2022, acting as a catalyst for the market. Another key indicator that people use to predict where the market is going is the yield curve, as that has predicted the past seven recessions we've had. The yield curve is the spread, i.e. the difference between yields on longer dated Treasury securities with shorter term Treasury securities. An increase in federal interest rates tends to flatten the curve because the yield curve reflects nominal interest rates. Higher nominal equals higher real interest rate plus lower inflation. A yield curve is just a line that plots yields, aka the interest rates of bonds, having equal credit quality but differing maturity dates. The slope of the yield curve gives an idea of future interest rate changes in economic activity. There are basically three types of yield curves that matter. The first one is the light blue normal upward sloping yield curve, which you want to see, which is when longer term bonds have higher yields than short term ones. Like if you borrow something far out in the future and the economy is good, then the rate should be higher than short term ones. Okay, the second type of yield curve is the flat gray one in the diagram, which is when yields stay the same over time. The third type of yield curve is one you don't want to see and it's the bottom yellowish inverted one where short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, which basically means that the future doesn't sound too hot, and the lower confidence in the future leads to lower long-term interest rates. This chart shows the 10-year to 1-year spread on Treasury yields over time. The thick red line is 0%, i.e. when the yields are the same, and below the red lines means we are less than 0, which means we inverted, and you can see that each time we inverted we went into a recession. So the bears would look at where we are today in 22 and say, look, the spread is heading towards inverting, which means recession. 
The bulls could counter with the fact that there are times where the spread reverses course, so the fact that it's close to 0% doesn't guarantee a recession, thus we could still probably avoid that recession for 2022. What we see now is that yields of short-term U.S. government debt have been rising fast this year, reflecting expectations of a series of rate hikes by the Fed, while longer-dated government bond yields have moved at a slower pace amid concerns that policy tightening may hurt the economy. When the yield becomes inverted, profit margins fall for companies that borrow cash at short-term rates and lend at long-term rates. Fortunately, yield curve inversions tend to have less of an impact on consumer staples and healthcare companies, which are not interest rate dependent, which is part of the reason I like to hold them as a dividend investor in my diversified portfolio. Plus, even if we go into a recession, then many investors often turn to defensive stocks like food, oil, and tobacco, all of which are often less affected by downturns in the economy. That makes sense if you think about it. I mean, even if the economy is bad, you still eat. You still drive your car. And if it's really bad, then vices like smoking are even more likely. All of which means those businesses are selling their products and getting revenue and cash flow and then are paying out dividends to us dividend investors. Okay, another indicator that some people look at to gauge whether we're going into a bear market is by looking at the Consumer Confidence Index, aka the CCI. If the CCI hasn't been over 100 in the last 24 months, then that's a bear sign, because it means consumer confidence is low. In simple terms, increased consumer confidence indicates economic growth in which consumers are spending money, indicating higher consumption. The idea is that the more confident people feel about the economy and their jobs and incomes, the more likely they are to make purchases. What we see is that we did indeed break 100 within the past two years, so that's a bullish sign. It's currently around a 99 and it's been trending down, but it can also abruptly change as we've seen. Okay, another indicator people look at is the VIX, which is a popular measure of the stock market's expectation of volatility based on S&P 500 index options. If the VIX spikes over 20 at some point within the last three months, then that's a bearish sign. Here we see that we have been over that, so the bears would be cheering. But the bulls could counter with sure, but it's been falling from its high of 30 a few weeks ago to under 20 now, so that's a bull trend. Of course, as always, it too can abruptly change. Moving on, another indicator some people look at is if stocks have had a 5% pullback in the last year. Looking at the SP500, we see that we're up 17% for the last 12 months, and from the recent fall was about 4.8%, so overall one for the bulls for 2022. Another indicator to predict the future market that some people use is evaluating if low quality stocks have outperformed high quality stocks over the last six months. While we did have some interesting meme stocks with AMC and GME, overall conservative blue chip stocks have held up better than other stocks. Quality always wins in the long run. So if you're investing in quality stocks, then there's a higher likelihood that 2022 could be a bull year for you. Okay, another indicator people look at that combines both stock price to earnings metrics combined with the consumer price index aka CPI is one that's called the rule of 20 where if trailing price to earning ratios added to CPI is above 20 then it's a bear sign. Thus the stock market is deemed to be undervalued when the sum is below 20 and overvalued when the sum is above 20. Right now we can see that the consumer price index is around a 6 and the median PE of the SP500 is a 26 so combined they're at 32 which translates into an overvalued market, a bear sign. PE itself historically is around a 15, so that 26 alone is also a sign that a bear market is more likely than a bull market for 2022. There are a ton of other indicators like how tight credit conditions are, how well stocks respond to earnings beats, how often earnings estimates are getting revised and by how much and in what direction, how much cash people are holding, you can go on and on. I just told you a bunch of financial indicators which, to varying degrees, have historically sometimes been helpful in predicting how the market is going to do. But now let me counter all that with investing advice from a prolific investor, Jack Bogle, aka the guy who founded Vanguard. He said, The idea that a bell rings to signal when to get into or out of the stock market is simply not credible. After nearly 50 years in this business, I don't know anybody who has done it successfully and consistently. I don't even know anybody who knows anybody who has. So what he's saying is that indicators like the yield curve and median price to earning ratios or whatever won't consistently and accurately tell you what's going to happen in the market. Thus, he would probably look at the yield curve and say, okay, it was right predicting a recession seven times in a row. I still won't bet my stocks on it. Thus, my advice is ignore all the indicator noise. Ignore all the macroeconomic headlines. 
Instead of worrying about CPIs and interest rates and what the future might bring, instead just build your portfolio based on long-term thinking and long-term convictions, and you should do great in the long run. Now after all that, do I think 2022 will be a bull or a bear market? I honestly have no idea. If I had to guess, I'd say bear. However, it's possible it's a bull market. But am I selling? No. I just try to own decent stocks and then I keep holding them and letting them pay my bills. I'll do that if we have a crash or if we don't. Recession or no recession. So my two cents for you is just to buy good companies when they're cheap and then go about your merry way. Don't panic sell, don't panic buy, don't mimic what anyone does on YouTube. Keep learning and practicing and in the long run I'm very confident your portfolio will be in a better spot than someone who doesn't do all that. Speaking of portfolios, M1 Brokerage has a promotion running for a free $50 cash bonus for new users. The way it works is you click on my M1 referral link in the description of this video and then either open a brokerage account and fund it with $100 or open a retirement account and fund it with $500. Then you need to keep your money inside the new account for 30 days from the date of deposit to get the free referral cash. Make sure to check out the details before you sign up to see what they're offering when you watch this video. Okay, now I'd like to shout out my latest Patreon aristocrats who've signed up since my last video. So thank you Hulan B for signing up. Thank you Nikav75. Thank you Blue8716. Thank you Risto. Thank you Nectaros V. Thank you PS for signing back up. And thank you to Chromag27, who recently upgraded from a Patreon champion to a Patreon king, which allows him to have monthly 30-minute private one-on-one -on -one voice discussions with me via my Discord server. Aristocrats gain access to my dividend spreadsheet product that I use in my videos, and they gain access to multiple private channels on my free dividend Discord chat server, where I let my upper-tier Patreons watch my videos before I release them to the public, as well as let them vote on which thumbnails they use for my videos, and of course they get more direct access to me. And if you made it this far in the video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Finally, I highly recommend that you join my free Dividend Discord chat server, which has thousands of dividend investors on it and is growing all the time. So thanks for watching this video, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.